10, seizing control. As part of a countersuit regarding the dispute surrounding the sale of the winery shares, Angelina Jolie's former company Novell has claimed that Brad Pitt wanted only to control the winery estate, Chateau Miravel, and that is why he is upset about the selling of the shares. In actuality, they claim he only wanted to control the joint financial venture and for years has been pushing them out and wasting assets on lavish projects that they deem completely unnecessary and unrelated to the winery's success, including a swimming pool and a recording studio, which I gotta say, doesn't seem super relevant to making wine, but you know. And friends, before we move on to this next spot, if you find this whole feud that's been going on for years between Brad and Angelina to be pretty crazy, let us know by giving this video a thumbs up. I think it's pretty crazy. Pretty sad, really. Number nine, Juliette Lewis. While this relationship has been lovingly reminisced on by both Juliette Lewis and Brad Pitt, the fact remains that it's kind of an odd one, even for the time period. The two ended up meeting on the set of California, with both of them being considered young hopeful talents of Hollywood at the time. They dated for four years and seemed to have a great and beautiful romance, and just as Brad Pitt was actually getting ready to blow up basically. But there was something a little odd about this relationship. When they started seeing each other, there was a 10 year gap between them. Now this might not seem super strange considering there have been you know, bigger age gaps in celebrity couples and in regular couples, and for some that still seems pretty normal. But the real weird part of it was that they were at two very different sort of points in their life with Brad being 27 or turning 27 and Juliet only being 17. Yeah, so she was still in high school. Which I mean, I guess they could still connect over work, both being performers, but other than that, their life experiences would have been probably pretty different at that point. Some people still find this to be an odd relationship today, especially considering it managed to go strong for four years. However, both of them still remember it pretty fondly. Although they no longer talk, which I think is pretty weird, but I guess it was a long time ago. Number eight, the divorce. I think one of the biggest red flags that people tend to overlook in cases like this is when things drag on. It's never a good sign and it can usually mean that there are bigger issues that are kind of being like danced around but not really unearthed or talked about. People who are able to put the past behind them and just move forward generally have nothing to dance around. That's why it's you know so easy for them to just move forward with their lives. They have let go and they don't hold things against their former partner. But with Brad and Angelina, both of them seem to be struggling to let go and are still stuck in disagreements with each other even to this day which could be an indicator that there is a bigger reason as to why they split, other than just deciding to go their own way. And that's what we're beginning to see really delved into now, as Jolie seems to realize that she maybe has to lay it all out or she'll never really be free. That she has to dive into some traumatic moments that she perhaps would have rather been kept a little bit more private and less publicized. There's also the fact that it took them three years to get themselves legally declared as single. Just declared as single, which is a long time. A standard divorce, by the way, takes between four to six months to get finalized, although obviously when there's custody battles and stuff involved, it can take longer. But it's still been a long time, even considering that. Number seven, addiction. After the split between Brad and Angelina, Pitt cited personal problems as one of the issues for sort of the arguments that led to their divorce. In response, he decided it was time to do something about these problems and admitted himself to AA. This might not be a red flag in the sense that obviously going to AA is a good thing if you have a problem all in all, but it is a red flag that he did so right after the divorce, implying that his misuse had gotten to the point that it was dramatically affecting his life, with the divorce and whatever happened to trigger it kind of acting as a wake up call for him, which kind of could be an indicator that there's something worse there. At least there was in the past, you know? Number six, NDA. In the current legal battle between Brad Pitt and Angelina Jolie, the two are now feuding over the winery that they once shared and what Angelina decided to do with said shares. Initially, the two had an agreement that they would get clearance before selling. But when Jolie sold her shares behind Pitt's back, he protested. It was reported that Jolie wanted out of the joint business ventures and that Pitt was willing to buy the shares, but then their deal fell through. And this was apparently after months of them negotiating. Well, Pitt claims this this was so that Jolie could purposefully harm him after he was awarded shared custody of their six children. Jolie claims their deal actually fell through because Pitt wanted her to sign an NDA as part of the sale to him. Jolie was unwilling to sign that NDA as she felt this would limit her capacity to speak the truth of why their marriage dissolved and problems surrounding it. She obviously just didn't want to be silenced, if that is the case. While the two have differing stories as to why this deal fell apart, if Jolie is speaking true, why did Brad want to keep her quiet and what were the terms? terms of the NDA covering. Also, if it was a relationship, how is that relate to selling the winery? That doesn't seem like it should be included at all. Number five, Harvey Weinstein. Although some say that Brad Pitt was one of the few who stood up to Weinstein, 
Epstein, this unfortunately wasn't always the case. When it comes to his relationship with the notorious producer, many tell of the 1995 story where Pitt stood up to him to protect his then girlfriend Gwyneth Paltrow, who confessed that Weinstein had severely mistreated her, which to be honest is an understatement. However, what those people seem to be missing or not focusing on is the fact that after this incident, although Pitt did stand up to him, he also later worked with him. What? The 2009 film Inglorious Bastards which Pitt starred in, was both distributed by and co-financed by the wine company. Angelina Jolie claims that Brad Pitt also approached the producer to work on his 2012 film, Killing Them Softly, whose company ended up as the distributor for that film, which really hurt her because she also had a bad experience with him too. So, like, what? It's also pretty messed up, I feel like, if you do that, when you know your wife is like, please don't work with this person. Number four, she said. So Brad Pitt is complicated when it comes to his history with Harvey he privately spoke out against him years ago in the 90s when he, you know, actively threatened a man when he put his hands on Paltrow, but then he was willing to work with him in 2009 and the 2010s. In 2019, he spoke out against the man, however, disavowing him and sharing the story of his experience defending Paltrow in the 90s. He also went on to executive produce the film She Said. Some people, though, deem this to be quite controversial, considering that Brad Pitt also seem to be willing to work with him only a few years ago, which seems hypocritical. Is it all a show or does Brad Pitt genuinely condemn this man? She said is a film that follows the New York Times investigation of Weinstein and is also being produced by Pitt's production company, Plan B Entertainment. Number three, allegations. Recently, things have escalated quite a bit in the legal cases between Brad and Angelina, with Angelina even bringing up a previous incident that seems to be the inciting one in terms of their divorce. She alleges that Brad severely mistreated her and their children while on a flight and based on the account given that's truly an understatement here. It said that Brad Pitt was under the influence and verbally attacked Angelina before turning on the kids when they came to their mother's defense, even getting physical. She also has attested that she and the kids are willing to provide evidence of this in court and she's even willing to testify. Number two, the kids don't want to see him. While Brad Pitt reportedly does see his younger kids but prefers to do so unphotographed, which honestly makes sense. I mean, who wants paparazzi around at all really to photograph anything other than maybe like a movie premiere. That's the only time I think. It's also reported that he perhaps hasn't seen his older kids in years. In fact, according to a source for US Weekly, Pitt does not have any kind of relationship with his eldest son, Maddox, and doesn't talk to Pax either. In fact, it seems that the inciting incident on the airplane in 2016 is likely where the breakdown of the relationship between son Maddox and father Brad began. The source is saying ever since then, it's been really rough between them. However, according to a source for People, Pitt does still see and maintain a good relationship with his younger children, having nightly dinners with them whenever they are in LA. But it's interesting that his older kids kids seem to not want to see him, especially as you know, they're older so they kind of have more, I guess, more agency in making that choice. Number one, testimony. Maddox doesn't only not have a good relationship with his father, but reportedly also testified against him during the custody battle. Although we don't know exactly what was said, an exclusive source told US Weekly, Maddox has already given testimony as an adult in the ongoing custody dispute, and it wasn't very flattering towards Brad. It's also been said that the distance is so great that Maddox even wants to legally change his name. The source added, he doesn't use Pitt as his last name on documents that aren't legal, and instead uses Jolie. Maddox wants to legally change his last name to Jolie, which Angelina has said she doesn't support. Number 10, at the age gap. When it was announced that Billie Eilish and Jesse Rutherford became an item mid-October, fans were very shocked to say in the least. The couple were spotted holding hands at Halloween Horror Night. Days later, they were photographed publicly making out outside of a popular restaurant in LA. Concerns were raised almost immediately around their age difference. If you don't know, Billy is 20 years old while Jesse is 31. The 11 year age gap between them is not a big deal on its own, but it immediately gets worse when you consider that Billy entered the public image as a 15 year old. It's normal for fans to feel a certain type of way about her dating someone old enough to have a mortgage. But of course, there's also the argument that as long as they're happy, they're both consenting adults and that's what really matters. Number nine, the Halloween costume. The internet practically exploded when photos of the internet practically exploded when photos were leaked of Jesse and Billy's disturbing couple's Halloween costume. If you're wondering about how they could possibly make people feel more icky about their relationship, Billy decided to dress up as a baby and Jesse went as an old man, but it was a couple's costume. The thing is that they were probably poking fun at people criticizing their age difference, but yes, there's plenty of reason for people to feel a little grossed out by their costume because it plays right into that creepy age stuff. Twitter was very quick to react to the photos, with one user writing, 
I wish I could wash my eyes with soap and scrub this from my mind. Good to know their fetish and why they're together. Another tweet said, the baby costume alone was okay. Seeing the whole picture, this is weird. They do get points for being self-aware, but the costume somehow made everything a little gross. Number eight, when they met. According to photos posted by a Jesse Rutherford fan account on Twitter, Billy and Jesse have actually known each other since 2017, when Billy was 15 and still on the rise as a musician. One viral tweet summed up the situation very well, saying Jesse Rutherford is literally 31 and Billy is not even 21 yet. They also posted a photo of a teenage Billy Eilish posing next to him. Someone commented under the photo saying she's still not old enough to drink alcohol and he's a grown man. While another user wrote, I had my years of thinking guys a decade older were normal. It's not. The post certainly calls into question the idea of what's appropriate and what's not in their relationship. But to be clear, at that point they had not started dating yet. Number seven, disturbing allegations. Last week, the neighborhood shocked fans when they announced the firing of their drummer, Brandon Fried, after several women came forward accusing him of SA. One of the women was Maria Zadoya, the lead singer of the LA-based indie pop band, The Marias. She made a post on the group's Instagram account on Sunday. Brandon had touched her inappropriately while at a bar the previous evening. She said, it was one of the most uncomfortable things I've ever experienced. I felt an invasion of my space, privacy, and body. Y'all need a new drummer. Brandon responded by apologizing for being such a drunk guy, but shortly after his post, the neighborhood announced nomination in a statement shared on the band's social media account. Maria's post drew outcry from fans who called on Brandon's bandmates for accountability, including lead singer Jesse. Many people called him out for staying silent about the allegations. In response to the news, one user tweeted, first Jesse Rutherford, now Brandon Fried. Wow, the neighborhood is so cooked. Number six, his song lyrics. Something that's been constantly brought up online in the wake of people finding out about Jesse and Billy's relationship is that they can no longer look at the music the same way. The reason being is that several of the neighborhood's track feature songs that center around the concept of being too young for certain things, like their hit song Daddy Issues, for example, because it's widely believed that the lyrics reference a young woman seeking to have a relationship with an older man in order to recreate the toxic or non-existent relationship that she had with her father. Pretty controversial stuff. And of course, people are drawing parallels between that song and the singer's romance with the much younger Billy. One user tweeted, the neighborhood has a whole new meaning now that Jesse Rutherford is a creep. Another person wrote, full disclosure, I really love the music of the neighborhood and have for years, but that doesn't really mean anything. I would much rather protect the women in the industry. Number five, Billy was a fan. Around the same time that Billy and Jesse first met when she was 15 and he was 26, the point that keeps being brought up is that she was always a big fan of his music and therefore she was easily able to be influenced by someone that she considered her favorite artist. The neighborhood first formed in 2011 and came onto the music scene not long after. So it's no surprise that they would have had a crowd of young fans by that point. For her part, Billy started working on songs with her brother Phineas in 2015 when she was only 13 years old. At that time, her brother had already been writing and producing music for several years and had his own band. In 2016, 14-year-old Billy would go on to release her first hit song titled Ocean Eyes and she exploded on the music scene. Although she certainly had a promising career ahead of her when she first met Jesse, some fans still believe that because she was a fan of him at the time, there was already a precedent set for a power imbalance in their relationship. Number four, the internet's reaction. It's safe to say that Billy and Jesse's relationship has been one of the most criticized to date. Judging from the reactions on the internet, you can clearly see that the majority of Billy Eilish fans almost believe that there is something inherently wrong with their relationship and there's something off about it. Even though the couple themselves have come out in defense of their romance. One user tweeted, Jesse Rutherford's 31 years old, but he's dating Billy Eilish who's 20. This has happened so many times too. Grown men in the industry have been preying on Billy through so-called romantic relationships. Also, he's known her since she was 15 and he was 26 at the time. Some have even compared it to Taylor Swift's relationship with a much older John Mayer, saying the whole Taylor Swift John Mayer thing happened like 14 years ago. And the fact that people's reaction to that and their reaction now to 31 year old Jesse Rutherford from the neighborhood dating 20 year old Billie Eilish is just saying that they're both adults so it's fine. It's baffling to me. Number three, the family's response. A lot of Billie fans have been calling out her family for supporting her relationship. Someone tweeted, Billie Eilish and Maria of the Marias deserves the love and defense y'all are willing to give to white men you think are very, very weird for blaming Billie Eilish for potentially dating a 30 year old man at 19. When the real conversation should be, how is her family allowing her to be continuously groomed and manipulated by these grown ass men with no interference? This backlash is largely due to response from Billy's older brother Phineas when he was asked about Jesse Rutherford. The 25 year old musician claimed that he was fully supportive of his little sister's 
relationship. He said, listen, as long as she's happy, I'm happy. A source close to the star has also claimed that Jesse and Phineas get along very well, and that he has even seen a change in Billy over the years, and said that she is ready for the relationship. So obviously, he doesn't seem to see any issue whatsoever. Number two, the couple's outfit. The new couple divided fans with their debut outfit. Ever since Billy and Jesse started dating earlier this year, they have generally kept their public appearances to a minimum. Up until their debut, they had never been seen together officially on any red carpet event. But recently, at a star-studded gala in LA, they finally made an appearance together in bold style. The two of them divided the internet once again when they opted for comfy monogrammed Gucci pajamas, accessorized with an eye mask, slippers, and a blanket. And yes, they were both wrapped up together. Some people thought it was adorable, and as usual, others thought it was just way too much. The PJs were definitely a surprise given the formality of the event. Billy wore a crop top, a long skirt with a lace trim slit, and a long robe that was all monogrammed in Gucci's signature house print. As for Jesse, he wore a silky loungewear set, including a button-up shirt and trousers, finished off with a pair of Gucci house slippers. So was it a fit or not? Well, that's still to be decided. And coming in at number one, hiding their relationship. In October this year, news broke out about their relationship after a fan spotted the musicians holding hands as they exited a haunted house at Halloween's Horror Nights in LA. A video of their interaction ended up going viral on Twitter, with many fans shocked at the news. Around the same time, they were also spotted eating dinner together at a vegan restaurant. Then on the 19th of October, pictures of them kissing outside a SoCal restaurant hit the press. The pair made it Instagram official when Billy posted some pictures of them on Halloween. There was also a short video of Jesse dressed as a clown. And on November the 6th, they made their red carpet debut at the LACMA event, posing together under a Gucci branded blanket. So with the way things unraveled and how news of their romance started circulating online, so has speculation as to why the couple chose to be so cryptic about their relationship in the first place. Number 10, The Rebound. Is Taylor using Maddie as a rebound from her ex, Joe? With her split from Joe reportedly being not too long ago, it has some fans speculating that she is moving on just a little too fast. Taylor had a very private relationship with Joe for six years before reportedly ending it earlier this year. But what does Joe think of all this? Fans were surprised after Taylor said, I've just never been this happy before in my life, and believed that she could be in the honeymoon phase with Maddie. A source close to Joe told the press, Joe feels slighted and is distraught after seeing her budding relationship with Matt, but is doing his best to keep busy and focus on himself. A few fans were also concerned that there could be some overlap between the two men, but the insider did deny that, saying Joe was aware that Taylor and Maddie were making music together and collaborating. She told him that they had become friends and he trusted her. What do you guys think about Maddie and Taylor? Could this last or is this just a fling? Number nine, blindsided. Another person who seemed to be shocked that Taylor and Maddie were reportedly together is Maddie's ex-girlfriend. His ex is Meredith Michelson, the professional model who has some thoughts about her ex's new relationship. Meredith was reportedly blindsided when she heard about the alleged romance. A report in the mirror claims that the model told her friends, I hope he treats her better than he treated me. The article goes on to claim that Maddie was actually staying at Meredith's apartment and was still dating her when he spent several days with Taylor at an LA recording studio. A source close to the model said, all the time Maddie was in the studio with Taylor, she thought nothing of it. He'll spend the day in the studio and then he'll come home to her. Allegedly, it only gets worse. An insider reveals, he just ghosted her and that was it. Then four weeks later, he went public with Taylor. A representative came forward following the release of this report and told Mirror, it is Maddie who should have to explain himself on these matters, not Meredith. Number eight, fan reactions. With many Swifties taking to Twitter following the news of the reported romance, it looks like the majority aren't too happy. With Maddie having a pretty controversial past, some Taylor supporters have written an open letter trying to urge the star to address Maddie's controversies, called the Speak Now campaign. The letter calls for more than a simple apology, and when talking about Maddie's actions, the letter states, his actions contribute to hatred, stereotypes, and objectification. The letter goes on to say, use your platform responsibly and intentionally. Advocate and celebrate diversity and promote empathy and understanding. While a few fans disagree with this and believe Taylor should be able to date whoever, they still are seemingly unsure about if Maddie is the right choice. But a moment that really had fans believing Taylor is in her red flag era is when she appeared to sing Lover to Maddie. When the song was initially written for Joe, the clip that is now circulating TikTok definitely has some strong opinions in the comment section. One user wrote, this is for dad, not him. Another added, after six years, I get moving on, but this was Joe's song. Number seven, we have the onstage antics. Maddie has done some pretty crazy things on stage throughout his career, some of which have had people questioning if he is right for Taylor. 
Taylor at all. During his 1975 tour, his performances gained a big reputation for being considered chaotic. The singer has been seen doing push-ups on stage and yelling at security. He even went as far to eat raw meat during his concert. But one thing that really got people talking was his habit of kissing fans. Luckily, he does reportedly always ask for consent, with one of them saying, he asked before he kissed me. He said, we don't have to snog if you don't want to. She recalled the moment as an insane experience and I honestly wouldn't doubt it. But even though he did ask for consent, the internet was still unsure about the whole thing. One Twitter user commented, it's a completely inappropriate power balance. There's an understood wall between performance, artist, and this completely shatters that wall in a dangerous way. Maddie didn't stop there though and almost exposed himself during another performance. In a clip that was posted to Twitter, shows the singer stripping down to his underwear before nearly showing the world maybe just a little bit too much. One user commented on the clip writing, I love typing Maddie Healy into the Twitter search bar every other week and catching up with all the crazy stuff he did. Another added, somebody lock this man up. Number six, emasculating. With all the speculation about the relationship between Maddie and Taylor, old interviews have begun resurfacing. And I have to say they do not make Maddie look good. Back in 2016, when he was asked if he was afraid of losing himself in a relationship, he responded by saying, yeah, absolutely. Going on to say, the reason I mentioned that is because if I had gone out with Taylor Swift, I would have been like effing hell. I am not being Taylor Swift's boyfriend. F that. He said that dating Taylor would be emasculating, saying that's also a man thing, an emasculating thing. When the rumors began circulating the two, he claimed in 2014 that there was nothing to it other than flirtation. When talking about this flirtation, he told Q at the time, I don't do anything else right, so it doesn't leave a lot of room for me going out or shagging someone. Going on to say, so the one time I did have flirtation with a girl, it ended up everywhere. I mean, I got on E! News and people were like, who's Maddie Healy? So that was cool. Seeming to like the attention that this brought him back then, he even went on to share in an interview how little Taylor meant to him in 2014. He said, if she wasn't Taylor Swift, we wouldn't be talking about her. She wasn't a big impact on my life. It's just interesting to me how interested the world is about Taylor Swift. It wasn't long before Taylor's fans came after him, forcing him to defend himself in a series of tweets. He tweeted, now I may admit to being an idiot on occasion, but I'm not a misogynist. This suggestion makes me very sad. Number five, the possible PR move. Could this quick move on from Joe and Maddie ghosting his girlfriend actually be a planned PR move? There's plenty of reasons a celebrity would get into a PR relationship, but what would be in it for each one? For Maddie, it seems a little bit more obvious considering his past isn't always considered the best. Taylor is considered one of the most famous celebrities on the planet right now, and it would definitely look good on him if he were dating such a megastar. His band, The 1975, is still doing amazing, but if he really is dating Taylor, many assume it'll just gain more attention for him and maybe allow him to look a little bit better in the media. But then where does this leave Taylor? Some internet detectives believe she could be using this as a way to distract from her breakup, from her long-term boyfriend, Joe. Others believe she could be using this to possibly hide another relationship. But what do you guys think about this speculation? Number four, racism. Maddie is no stranger to being controversial, but his remarks during an interview on the podcast, The Adam Fryland Show, have really landed him in some hot water. In February, Maddie appeared on the podcast and within 15 minutes, it really took a turn. During the conversation, Maddie and the host made derogatory comments about women and mocked the Scots language and both Chinese and Hawaiian accents, as well as calling the Scottish language medieval. This all began when Maddie first mentioned the rapper Ice Spice, sparking a conversation about what her heritage is. They went on to refer to her as Hawaiian, Inuit, and Chinese while mocking the accents. The group also joked about women's periods, discussing how the moon controlled menstrual cycles. One of the hosts said, it's so funny that women get effed up by the moon. Meanwhile, we went there, men. When Maddie laughed along with this and said, F yeah, Twitter users shared their thoughts online with one user writing, this is all part of why racism exists. They think it's funny. Some of you are so racist, you don't see the racism. It's racism disguised as humor. Another added, Maddie Healy, what the F is wrong with you? This made Swifties question Taylor's decision to allegedly be dating him. A few believe she could be going from a seemingly safe bed of Joe to the bad boy musician who is surrounded in controversy for just a little bit of a change. Number three, homophobia. Another incident that sparked debate was Maddie making some comments on the Adam Fryland show that could be considered homophobic. During the interview, Maddie says, Pink's getting canceled for looking like a lesbian for her career and now that's being regarded as queer baiting. Going on to say, loads of 18 year olds are being like, she's done irreparable damage to the lesbian community. The group all then have a conversation involving some pretty homophobic topics, as well as Harry Styles' alleged queer baiting. Maddie then says, when 
and disgusting Harry, he gets a pass. I don't know. I don't actually think the gays like it. It's the young girls that think it's a new thing and they're like, oh my god. Twitter users began tweeting how unshocked they were about this whole podcast. With one writing, Maddie Healy being a horrible human, part 100. This is another moment that Swifties are using as being a red flag for Taylor. Taylor has been considered a huge part of the LGBT plus community as an ally throughout her career for years. She's even donated quite a bit of money to Tennessee's Equality Project to help push back on the bills that were announced to tear down the community. Taylor also came out with the song You Need to Calm Down, which many consider to be a queer anthem. With her supporting the community over the years, it has made a few Swifties believe that this romance may not work long term if Maddie's controversial humor keeps being an issue. Number two, we have a repeat of 2014. Could this be a fling for closure from not pursuing something before? Maddie first appeared to be a Swifty back in 2014 when he wore a Taylor 1989 Swift shirt during one of his concerts with his band, The 1975. Taylor then proved to be a fan of his band too when she shared a video from his concert the same year. The clip showed her and Selena singing along to the single The City. She was then spotted in a 1975 shirt while taking a walk through LA. During a radio interview in 2014, Maddie admitted he met Taylor and that she went backstage at one of his concerts and said, I met Taylor and that was really nice. We exchanged numbers. Let's see what happens. He added at the time, what am I going to do? Go out with Taylor Swift? She's a sensation. I wouldn't say no. The two at the time never really dated, but it definitely did look like there was a close call at one point. The two have been known to be friends over the years, so maybe this is a chance to see if they made a mistake back in 2014 by not dating. And at number one, we have Louis Capaldi. Does Maddie's friend and fellow singer Louis Capaldi know more than he's letting on? Louis has his TikTok fans questioning what he knows about his friend and Taylor's rumored romance. In his TikTok, it shows Louis with edited clips and effects over the text that says, random people on the internet preparing to give their thoughts on Taylor Swift, Maddie Healy discourse. Going on to say, the world must hear what I have to say. This really got fans talking, especially since he put quotations over the Taylor Swift and Maddie Healy discourse. Fans took to the comments with one saying, bestie spill the tea. And another adding, so you're saying it's a publicity stunt. Who knows if Louie will ever tell us what he supposedly knows. Number 10, ignoring Haley. The model was posing in front of the cameras at the Vanity Fair party, but this year she was noticeably alone as Justin decided not to pose with her. While Haley was walking the red carpet by herself, he was nowhere to be found. Instead, he was photographed inside the party looking a little disheveled, but very comfortable. Justin was wearing a backwards baseball cap with a colorful blanket draped over his shoulders. It's possible that he couldn't be bothered with all the red carpet attire and wanted to go straight to the party. After all, he was wearing a literal blanket, but in the middle of her drama with Selena Gomez, that was probably not the best idea. It seemed like he was trying to distance himself from his wife and everything that she was going through at the time. Later on, he did post a photo of the two of them from inside the party on his Instagram, but he's never really shown any public support in the weeks that the feud went on. This was concerning to a lot of fans who supported Haley because it seemed like not even her husband was coming to her defense. The fact that Justin simply didn't want to get involved said a lot about their relationship. Number 9, Slamming the Door. In 2020, Justin got a ton of flack from fans in a paparazzi video that went viral. Despite claims that he is a gentleman, his behavior around his wife has been far from chivalrous. And that only refers to what's actually been caught on camera. In a shocking clip, you can see the singer pulled up in a black chauffeured SUV. As he got out of the car, he looks visually annoyed as if he just had some kind of meltdown inside the car. Without looking back, he carelessly slammed the door in Haley's face. She tragically followed him with without any real pushback and even tried to point him in the right direction when she finally caught up to him. The only thing she said was, babe, I think this is the right way. Of course, a lot of people were sickened with the whole video because it really looked like a textbook toxic relationship. Seeing Haley be automatically apologetic after Justin clearly embarrassed her in front of everyone was triggering for a lot of people. In the comments, one person wrote, she needs to wake up. If a man treats you like that, he doesn't love you. Another person wrote, ah, if I was Haley, I would get a divorce and move out of the country. So it seems like most people were encouraging her to break up with him. Number 8, dissing their marriage. In the midst of the drama, fans have continually brought up an interview of Justin talking about the downsides of his relationship. Apparently he struggled after realizing that his marriage to Haley wouldn't instantly make him a better person. He said, it is a journey. I remember when I first got married, I hit a little bit of an emotional breakdown because I thought marriage was going to fix all of my problems and it didn't. He went on to say that he felt like a hypocrite because he wanted Haley to do something that he wasn't doing for himself. Although Justin was obviously speaking from the heart here, many fans were mocking the video, saying that he only feels that way because he's with the wrong person. Shortly after they tied
tied the knot, Haley and Justin did an interview with Vogue where they talked about going to a marriage counselor. Haley said, The thing is, marriage is very hard. That is a sentence you should lead with. It's really effing hard, which is something that they both could agree on. Now, that doesn't mean that they're immediately going to divorce, but some would say that it's not a great sign of the future of their relationship. Number seven, running away from Haley. In September of 2021, there was a shocking video posted on Twitter that showed Justin literally running away from paparazzi and leaving Haley behind while she falls to the ground. In the clip, you can see him get out of the car with his skateboard and just take off without saying anything. At first, it looks like he's alone and just doing his own thing. But one second later, and Haley literally falls out and looks flustered. She seems to be confused at the fact that she got left behind. And to make things so much worse, this all happened on a busy street and so many people watched it happen. She then sprints after him and obviously tries to catch up, but Justin is already out of sight. The whole thing must have been incredibly embarrassing for her. And that's exactly what the comments said. One person wrote, I know this keeps her awake every night and that's why you shouldn't chase men. However, fans were also a little more sympathetic to her situation, considering that a lot of people could relate to having a partner that just doesn't really care about them. One person said, as much as we may not like her, no female deserves to be treated like this by their husband. She deserves better regardless. Number six, allegations of cheating. We all know Justin got together with Haley very quickly after he ended things with Selena Gomez in June of 2018. So ever since then, cheating rumors have followed the couple. For her part, Haley has adamantly denied this was the case and said that Selena and Justin weren't as serious as everyone thought they were when they got back together briefly in 2018. She said, as a woman, I would never want to get into a relationship with someone and be engaged to them and be getting married to them and be thinking in the back of my mind, I wonder if that door was really closed. I know for a fact that the reason we were able to get back together was because it was very much completely closed. But for her part, Selena commented on a TikTok in a way that suggested that was not the whole truth. One of her fans posted a video saying, does anyone just ever feel really bad for Selena Gomez? Like, can you imagine going through a breakup so publicly with a guy that you were in love with for like seven years and then like two months later, he just marries someone? In response, Selena wrote in the comments, that made me cry, thank you. So even though Haley swears that there was no overlap whatsoever, the timeline has always been a little bit sketchy. Number five, the Facebook Live. A video has recently resurfaced online of Haley and Bieber on Facebook Live in May of 2020. In the clip, Haley admitted to the constant comparisons that she gets to Selena Gomez, and she says that gets really overwhelming. Quote, the ways that I feel like people have made comparisons and just put me in a position where they've really made me feel like less of a woman. It's not easy. And all this time, while Haley is pouring her heart out on camera, Justin is not really being supportive. While she's talking, he keeps a poker face and just gazes blankly off the camera. Now that people are re-watching the video almost three years later, they're pretty shocked by his lack of response. In fact, his facial expressions are so vacant that some people even joked that he looked like a cardboard cutout or a green screen projection. Fans felt that his body language was a major red flag for their relationship. Someone in the comments suggested that he was being hypnotized just to sit there. Most people could agree that he genuinely looked like he would rather be anywhere else. So was this clip an indicator that their relationship is not that great behind the scenes? Or do you think everyone's just reading into this a little too much? Number four, screaming at Haley. In July of 2021, the couple were in Las Vegas to celebrate Kendall Jenner's new tequila brand, 818. As the night ended, a TikTok user by the name of Yanjarik23 posted a video of Justin and Haley leaving the club with fans and bodyguards around them. In the video, they could be seen holding hands, but as they were walking down the halls of the hotel, Justin very clearly looked like he was yelling at her. That clip went viral on TikTok with more than 1.2 million views and it drew concern from fans everywhere. From that point on, the comment section was filled with theories about why he was screaming at her and so many people put it down to a sign of a toxic relationship. After all, who yells at their partner like that? Before it was deleted, fans seemed to turn on Justin for the way that he was treating Haley. although some came to his defense and claimed that he wasn't yelling at her out of anger but maybe it was out of excitement. Sadly though, that was far from the only video that came out about them showing him losing control of his temper. Number three, Justin saying don't touch me. Obviously every relationship is different and every couple has different boundaries but fans were still pretty shocked to see a video of Haley making Justin physically uncomfortable. In the video they're doing a live stream of some kind and he's sitting down casually while she's standing behind him with her arms crossed. He then tries to be affectionate and put her arms around him which he instantly physically reacts to. Justin becomes annoyed and says babe I can't don't touch me right now. At first Haley seems confused and she can't really tell if he's being all that serious. She then keeps her arms there, but then he says, just in general, that just happens sometimes. I just need some space. So he was trying to be nice about it and communicate with her honestly.
honestly. And in terms of body language, you can tell that he wasn't loving the way that he was being touched. A lot of people called Haley out for disrespecting his boundaries and making him feel stressed. But of course, there were also those fans who felt that this was a sign that he just doesn't like her anymore because he keeps getting annoyed with every little thing that she does. Number two, argument on live. In a Facebook Live, Justin and Haley can be seen sitting on a couch answering questions about his Lyme disease diagnosis. At one point, they get asked whether or not he's scared about the diagnosis. And even though the question was clearly directed at Justin, for some reason, Haley decides to answer instead. Midway through her response, he then cuts her off and says, no, she was asking me. What follows is a long, awkward silence, which eventually breaks into a laugh. He then says, they're asking me because it's my Lyme disease. It's not your Lyme disease. In response, Haley says that she's the one who's been going to all his doctor's appointments with him. But then Justin cuts her off one more time and says, listen here, woman. And that is obviously one of the worst things he could have said to her. After that, they decided to end the live stream, but not before Haley made a sarcastic comment about his attitude. At this point, it's pretty obvious that there was a lot of tension between them, which might have been exacerbated by Justin's health condition. Because at the time, he also had a serious case of mono, which he says was affecting his skin, his brain function, and also his energy. And coming in at number one, how they met. In 2020, Justin sat down with Demi Lovato on The Ellen DeGeneres Show, and he talked about how he met his wife. He said, I think because she was raised Christian and they found out that, I think it was an arranged marriage. I'm pretty sure looking back now, it was definitely an arranged marriage. They set this whole thing up. He explains that since Haley was raised Christian, her dad Stephen Baldwin decided to introduce them because he thought that they would have similar values and believe the same thing. He says, it was definitely an arranged marriage now that I'm thinking about it. Even though Demi kind of laughed off the idea, Justin just kept on repeating how he thought it was arranged. Of course, he was joking, but at the same time, fans took this interview as proof that he was being serious. In fact, there's now been a ton of videos posted where people try to use this to explain how their marriage was a setup and Justin was somehow tricked. Their first meeting was all the way back in 2009 and it was actually captured on camera. So judging from that footage, we'd get a better idea of whether or not it looked like a setup. So just when you thought the situation couldn't get any worse, now another woman is coming forward with accusations against Jonah Hill. In a series of tweets published over the weekend, Zoe 101 star Alexa Nicholas said that he lured her away from a party and attacked her when she was 16 and he was 24. She didn't mention the year of the party, but she insinuates that it happened sometime in 2008. Alexa said that she and a friend who was also around 16 or 17 were both at a party at Justin Long's house. She accused him and his roommate at the time, who was a CSI Miami actor, Jonathan Togo, of purposely getting her and her friend drunk and that they were all aware that she was underage. Alexa wrote that she was pretty intoxicated once Jonah arrived at the party. She said that they were all pretty wasted because they were being fed a bunch of alcohol. Alexa recalled asking him for a cigarette at one point in the night. She said that he told her if she wanted one, she would have to go with him to his car, which was right outside, because apparently he didn't want to go outside all alone. The two of them then went to the car to retrieve these cigarettes, but she said that he never actually gave it to her, which she thought was a little weird. In her last tweet, she wrote, as we walked back to the door, I asked him for it and he said nothing, but slammed me to the door and shoved his tongue down my throat. I was so appalled, I pushed him off me and ran inside. Alexa also accused Togo of taking advantage of her drunk and underage friend during the party. She also blasted Justin Long for creating an environment where young girls could be taken advantage of by older men. She compared him to his character in Barbarian, who was ironically an actor who got fired from his TV show over allegations that he SA'd his co-star. Alexis wrote, hey, Justin Long, I find it interesting that you being in Barbarian as a predator. It must have been weird playing some of your friends. She accused him of being complicit in what his roommate was doing and questioned why he even allowed underage people to be at his house late at night. Soon after these allegations came out, a representative for Justin Long told HuffPost that he had no knowledge of the incident. Quote, this is the first time Justin has been made aware of the situation that allegedly happened nearly two decades ago. While Justin is sympathetic to any and all victims, the simple fact remains that he has no knowledge of what may or may not have happened concerning Miss Nicholas. While a lot of people have been supportive of these latest allegations, there's also been a fair amount of people questioning them and even criticizing them. The most common problem that seems to be coming up is the question of why now? After all, this supposed story takes place 15 years ago. Well, in another tweet, Alexa explained that she was sharing this information now because she had been traumatized by men in Hollywood and that things have to change. She said, this type of predatory behavior was hyper normalized when I was a kid. I'm proud to see women standing up now. Another thing that brought this up was the accusations coming from Jonah Hill's ex girlfriend.
girlfriend Sarah Brady, who last week publicly shared a series of text messages that Jonah sent her, all of which seemed to exhibit some kind of emotionally manipulative behaviour. Alexis said that Sarah's actions were admirable and that she was inspired to come forward with her own story. But this is far from the first time that she's actually spoken up about her experiences in Hollywood. Just last year, she organised a protest outside of Nickelodeon headquarters after coming out with allegations against Dan Schneider. In recent years, Alexa has been active in her advocacy for survivors of SA, and she leads her own organisation called Eat Predators. While standing at the studio's front doors, she alleged that during her time on the show, she and fellow child actors were not safe. She revealed that she didn't feel Nickelodeon had her best interests in mind when she was a child actor, and called her entire experience there traumatic. She believes in exposing the truth about the network's business practices and calls out Nick's excessive use of NDAs, which she says silence children and prevent them from getting help. She was also one of the only Nick stars to publicly stand by Jeanette McCurdy when she spoke up about her own experiences with Dan Schneider. In doing so, both women broke more than two decades of silence and put their own careers on the line to expose the truth about the industry. So if anything, this just goes to show you that no matter how long it's been, everything comes out eventually. Thank <laughs> you.